Hello, thanks. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. I guess we're here at ETH Denver and it's pretty crazy. Uh, a lot of people that are not paying attention to me talking right now, but there are a few people here, so I do appreciate that. Um, right, so I am here talking about uh, the data layer, uh, for lack of a better term. It's something I made up when I had to come up with the slide title. Uh, but I think it'll be, it'll be relevant. And um, I guess what I mean by the data layer is it's almost like the web that we were promised or the web that... Uh, the TV show, um, uh, you know, that Pied Piper is supposed to be giving us, uh, which is a sort of like ubiquitous, fast, cheap, computable, highly available web of data where we can actually build, you know, unique and interesting experiences. And so far we haven't really got what we were told. Maybe it's what we got what we deserve, but we haven't got what we were promised. And so I want to talk about maybe why and how we can get ourselves there with the infrastructure that we've spent a lot of t the la last couple of years building. So um, the web that we maybe deserve or that we've got so far is, is basically a web built on the cloud. And a lot of the data on that web is built into sort of cloud object storage. And you know, there's lots of different ways to talk about it or define it or like who invented it and who did it best. Most people are familiar with Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud Services and all these things. But when we're talking about cloud and cloud storage, we're talking about some computers out there that have a bunch of nice features. And that came about because before we had sort of someone, your data on someone else's computer, we had basically every business building bespoke storage systems and backend databases and all of the infrastructure that they needed to make their thing, their app or their experience work. So that was like, you know, a part of pre-cloud era, you might call it. Then in 2006, after lots of other people came up with really great ideas, uh, Amazon kind of built a business around it because they said, wow, we're building all this bespoke hardware to run our giant book selling uh, website. Maybe other people are going to want to do that too. So we started seeing things like Amazon Web Services and they started to really, you know, arguably pioneer that. Uh, build it once and then use many, many, many people use the same infrastructure. And then Google came along and Microsoft came along and, and started to create a competitive environment where actually like costs got even cheaper, speeds got even better. And we had this pretty great, you know, ecosystem of like of competitors are trying to build a great product that people use that's cheap and but it's like perfect. And it's kind of exactly what something like Filecoin is being built to leverage. Uh, and Filecoin sort of trying to build both of those sides of that market to drive that competition. But it turns out, you know, like actually, cloud services are pretty good though, right? So we, we, we better be able to do better than that, or we better be able to provide something better on top of that. Because it does, it works pretty good. Costs are pretty low. Most people get the experience that they want. Um, and so, you know, we've ended up with some pretty good APIs and good experiences. And it's good for stuff, right? Like the cloud that we have now is pretty, pretty good, especially if you're building like a static website or like um, somewhere where you're pushing a lot of data but not requesting it very often. Um, it's very scalable. The APIs are very agnostic to what your specific data looks like. So that's a great way to design infrastructure. It's super flexible. It's actually elastic, it's very flexible. It'll meet the demands of you and your users as you're, if you're a developer. Um, and it is pretty cost effective. It's actually pretty cheap. You hear stor horror stories where some website suddenly becomes extremely powerful and it costs them $40,000 in one week. And that's a website that charges nothing to their users for anything, so how the heck are they gonna pay for that? So you hear those horror stories. That's a problem. Maybe we could solve that. Um, but by and large, it works really well. And one of the things that I talk to a lot of people about is like sort of raw databases and data storage. And it turns out that the cloud that we have right now is really good for distributing and storing lots of data and, and querying it and analyzing it and doing all sorts of fun stuff. And we kind of, we've kind of landed on the idea of a data lake, which I like because it sort of implies li data liquidity and this like sort of movability of data which is totally not what it actually is. But it's a, nice, it's a nice image. So it's good for that kind of stuff. And so 
kind of sticking on that front for a second, what's happened is, you know, we wanted a better way to do things and to store data and to build experiences. Cloud services emerged as a really great way to do that. They kind of centralize around a, a few key players, but we're okay with that because they technically store data all over the world, so that's pretty nice. Um, and then what's happened is people are going, oh wow, this infrastructure is really great. I should actually start to build my systems to leverage the way that that infrastructure is built. So now we're starting to see people building cloud native data formats, cloud native web applications, and things that are designed specifically to run on that type of infrastructure. And this is great because now we're having, we have like sort of distribution of all of the data. We have optimization on terms of where all that data is stored and how fast we can get it. It's cheap. And we're also optimizing on that uh, distribution layer. So not only is it cheap, but it's even more cheap because I'm doing a better job of leveraging the underlying infrastructure. So we have these cloud native formats, and I want to talk about data formats for a second just because it's something I spend a lot of time thinking about, that are designed specifically for retrieval from cloud object storage, from cloud storage. And uh, you can do crazy, crazy stuff with these data formats. One of the ones, I come from a geospatial data background, so one of the ones I like a lot, I don't know if this is animating, it doesn't seem to be. But this is a, a slippy map that you interact with, just like a you know, Google Maps or whatever. But it's driven by one single large file stored in a Amazon S3 bucket. And what happens is every time you move that slippy map, a different range request to a different part of the file is sent fetches the data and retrieves it. But it's just one file, extremely easy to manage. When I'm slipping and moving my map around, I'm only fetching the tiny little bits of data that I need, so it's super efficient. And it's geared towards exactly how the data is laid out and stored on the network. So we get hyper-optimization. You can do the same crazy thing with a database. So here's an example where I have a database, DuckDB, and I'm querying and running analytics over some data that I have no physical access to, but my computer is basically making tiny range requests to some cloud provider somewhere and only grabbing the little bits of data that I need to answer my query. And that could be like, just give me all of the token holders for my DPIN project with over X spork, right? And I can just get enough data to satisfy that query. Now, this is really cool and this is really powerful and it provides effectively a unified interface for me to build any tool on top of data. As long as I can get, I can take advantage of the sort of structure of these data formats, I get a unified interface for this. It's S3 sort of buckets, queries to buckets. It's almost like just key value queries. And that's great, and that means I have access to a whole slew of other tools that are using the same interface that I am. So DuckDB, map tiles, geospatial data, financial data, all different types of data sources and formats can leverage the same unifying interface. And it works great. But it also doesn't always work great. And for a quick sort of like example, here's me making a bunch of queries to some data that I don't have control over. How do I know that when I ask for you know, this set of bytes, I actually get back the right data that I'm expecting, right? So, I, what makes Web2 uh, cloud systems really, really handy also makes them uh, a little less trustful, a little more uh, dangerous to use when I'm actually trying to drive like on-chain or like real insights um, from that data. So and I'm, at, I'm sitting here at the Filecoin booth at ETH Denver, so I'm not going to have to tell people that you know, it's important to decentralize things because I think we can probably, so I've pretty much skipped this slide. But the point is, I've got this great interface that I can leverage, but it doesn't have all of the benefits of a decentralized network like Filecoin or any other file-based storage system. And it does have all of the centralizing factors of uh, something like a Web2 platform, where you know, sometimes it makes a lot of sense to scale things out in a centralized way. So there are some security threats here. But one of the really interesting things that we're seeing right now, on top of these more traditional threats from a Web2 sort of perspective or a centralized perspective is we're seeing the emergence of a lot of D-pins. Maybe people have seen talks this week about D-pins. One of the interesting things about D-pins is their primary 
valuable asset is their data. And most of these DPINs are, are nascent new projects and they're storing their most valuable asset, the thing that is actually driving the value for their token, on centralized servers somewhere, right? Because that's pretty convenient and useful to do. Which means that this decentralized protocol, the thing that makes them the most valuable is not decentralized. Which pretty much automatically makes them a security, not a decentralized token. So we have to sort of say like, oh, it, it would be nice to make this decentralized, but not only would it be nice, but it actually, it's your job. You're going to have to do this and you're going to have to do it pretty quick. So we're starting to talk to a lot of teams and saying like, yeah, I know, it, wouldn't it be nice to be centralized, but you, you have to do it quicker than you think. So how do we make it easier to do that? And I'll skip this um, because I was just reiterating some other points. And so how do we make it easier to do this? Well, you know, I have the solution for you um, is the sales pitch. But, you know, we're, we're trying to build, like many other teams, ways to make it easier to get from my Amazon S3 setup to actually storing and archiving data on Filecoin. And the way that you do that, you know, from a real practical business sense is you meet developers where they're already at. And so we have been doing this experiment, which we're calling, uh, you know, we're codenaming it Basin. But, you know, this project codenamed Basin is basically decentralized S3 that uh, rolls up and settles on Filecoin. So you can use the same S3 APIs, the same HTTP clients, all the same tooling. You can use DuckDB, you can run Slippy Maps, but at the end of the day, that data is actually stored with storage providers on the Filecoin network. And it's stored and accessed as a hot layer by decentralized nodes that are running on Filecoin's IPC subnet infrastructure. So Project Basin, it's decentralized object storage, which, is exactly meeting developers where they are. In fact, it's going a step further and saying, not only will I meet you where you are, but if you just swap this out, you don't have to change anything at all. You don't have to change how you're building your application. And you know, there's lots of use cases because there are lots of use cases for cloud storage. So all of those use cases become our use cases. And we've run experiments where we can run a slippy map off of a decentralized network live, and I'll show you an example of this where you can load, put your NFT assets or your game assets in a bucket just like you can on S3, um, where you can uh, distribute and disseminate large volumes of data between small peers and make that data available. Um, and we're talking about it here today and we're talking about it tomorrow at an event called Proof of Data. Um, and we're seeing lots of people interested in this type of approach. And here's an example of an experiment we did where we literally took a regular data analytics pipeline and implemented it on top of our own infrastructure and it just kind of translates directly. Uh, and if you're familiar with the textile team, you might know that we also build a thing called Tableland, which is a SQL database. And so you might say, why the heck are you building this other thing? You've already got a database, like isn't that enough? And it turns out, well, you can build a database on top of cloud storage, many companies do. So the things that we're building now benefit the things we've built already before. So you can implement databases on top. Uh, now I think I'm almost out of time, um, but I'll go through a couple of examples until someone pushes me off the stage. So uh, this is for the developers in the room or on if, who, who might be watching the recording. This isn't just an idea. We're actually working with the IPC team to build out um, this infrastructure layer. And so you can actually do some pretty fun and exciting things. This is an actual consensus-based blockchain that's doing real work to come to consensus over the state of basically an S3 uh, bucket or um, a blob store. So here's an example where I'm actually using an HTTP API to upload a really large image. Uh, in this case, it's a super cool image of uh, some ChatGPT generated network, I'm sure. Uh, and when I upload that file, I automatically get back an actual transaction with our actual transaction hash at a given height on this uh, blockchain that tells me how much it costs the network to do it, um, what it looks like, the state of the actual um, um, blob storage. And this part's important 
Because I mentioned earlier, when I use DuckDB to make queries to a cloud database, and I get back some results, how do I know I'm getting back the right results? Well, now we can leverage all of the features of Web3 that Web3 is really good at, like uh, authenticated data structures, and hashes, and hash links. So that when I say I want to query this database that is backed by this hash, when I get back data, I know and I can actually verify and calculate proofs that the data that I get back actually was part of that, high, that larger CID or that larger bit of content. So I can do all those queries and then get proof back that the results are correct. And I kind of get this you know, for free because I'm leveraging a blockchain that supports uh, Merkle structures. Uh, and then you can do things like actually treat it not just like a, like a file storage thing, but treat it like an actual S3 block storage and list off the keys. In this case, I've got one key called DataNet with a value that is a CID and it's been resolved by the network. So it means that it's available. I can ask now any peer for this and I'm guaranteed to be able to get it back. Or guaranteed insofar as the network continues to operate. But again, this is just a blockchain with nodes running a consensus, custom consensus based on IPC. So I can get all the blockchain-y things that I want. I can query this data structure at any point in the past as well. So if I want to find out, you know, what did this S3 style bucket look like yesterday, I can still query it based on what it looked like yesterday. Uh, and so on and so forth. A bunch more things that we can do to actually query and treat this thing like a, uh, a, a, like a log of updates, exactly what it is. Something that you can't actually get from a traditional Web2 uh, object storage system. So we get kind of the best of both worlds is what I'm trying to get at. And the throughput is still really good. It's still fast. You can still get sub-second latency. You can still query it. You can still run a live database on top of this thing. Um, and there's other options that you can sort of start to play around with. And we work with a lot of DPINs who have like real-time event streams that want to be able to back that up and have it available um, in a persistent way. We can do that sort of thing as well. And we can do that because We've, got, we've built the infrastructure to do that. We've got the authenticated data structures to prove that we're doing that. And all these things kind of are coming together now at this point in time. So this is very exciting. Um, and we've run some experiments to prove that this is, this is actually probably going to work. Um, one of them is that we drive slippy maps from a live network of nodes. Another is, you know, everybody is excited about frames and Farcaster, so we've done some experiments there to drive experiences on Farcaster um, or store Farcaster logs on uh, Filecoin through an S3 API. Um, and even doing things like actually using the data stored within these S3-like uh, um, blobs or buckets to drive off-chain compute. So you can imagine something like Baclau or uh, Fluence or these other networks that are designed for compute, they can actually access and leverage the data that's stored in I, on, the, um, on this subnet within the Filecoin ecosystem. They can actually run compute over this and then generate new outputs and update those buckets and, and do all of the things that you get in a sort of Amazon S3 world except in a fully decentralized way across different service providers instead of being focused within a single one. So that's pretty much it from me. Thanks for the giant audience that's sitting in front of me right now. Um, it's, it's a crazy week here at uh, ETH Denver. I've had a lot of fun. Hopefully everybody else is as well. And um, yeah, it's time for the data layer, I guess. We'll see you there.